this is an explores video and i am aj and i welcome you come with me my friends and i consider you to be friends at this point point. and what is often expressed as the ultimate act of friendship hiding the body yes maybe giving a kidney certainly of course following them to the very gates of hell we return to the nine hells today and the plane the planet of bartor the orb of punishment, the realm of lawful evil, the home of the devils and the dukes of hell, the damned, the indentured, the armies and agents, and the god Asmodeus. First, let's talk a little bit about City of Doors, because we're starting our journey from here, and a conversation overheard at a venue, uh, without it seems any sort of purpose. Just some stark rock walls that look a bit like uh, someone tore a section from a fabulous cathedral and took away all the furniture. But this place is not about what it holds, but who goes there. Standing next to each other, deep in conversation, is an angel and a devil. And no, they're not trying to kill each other. In fact, the conversation could best be described as painfully polite, but with whole worlds of words left unspoken. Angels and devils are, if not destroyed, immortal beings, many of which have been around for thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years. So this is not a rushed conversation, it is not a glib conversation, it is not one without a great import and consequence. The language they are speaking is audible, they are not using telepathy with each other, and the words are very old. They sound like there are so many other languages. And a lot like divine spellcasters sound when they are saying those words that split the air with beams of intense light or cause flesh to knit back together. At times the words do make a mortal's flesh crawl or inspire confidence and hope, even if they're not understood. What are these two ancient beings talking about? The fate of the soul of a mortal champion? The fall of an empire? The location of an artifact of great power? The sharing of information on suspected operant machinations? The discovery of a new prime material plane, the negotiations between two greater beings who cannot step foot in the cage or be in the presence of each other, so these two speak on their behalf. Something more basic, something incomprehensible. Whatever it is, they came to this place because they built it, and none would dare move a grain of stone from it. There is even a respectable lack of building crowding around it and over it, and the Dabu ensure that no signs are posted on it. No vines grow on it. Nobody lingers here or messes around in this place. The two figures part. The angels nod to you and fades from view, like dawn light slipping behind a silver cloud. There is a smell of frankincense in the air. The devil glances over at you, deep in thought, locks its eyes on yours, and you are unsure if it is thinking about you at all or you're just wallpaper to it. Then its eyes flicker to look at a dagger you recently picked up at an ancient tomb. It once belonged to a paladin of a god you, you don't follow. The devil locks eyes on you again, slowly walks past you. There is a smell like gunpowder and rusty metal. You hear a soft chuckle, then it turns a corner and is gone. You look down at the knife. Maybe it would be best to return it to where it belongs and stop using its enchantments so selfishly. You step out of the building and the street is strangely quiet and empty. You look around and notice that the fog has lifted somewhat. and You can almost see all the way up to the spire. Then you notice a shadow in front of you, and something inside you prompts you to step back as if it were lava. You turn and look at the tall, silent figure of the Lady of Pain. The passive mask seems to be looking right into you, and you quickly avert your gaze. This is the first and perhaps only time you'll see her, out in the open and just hovering there like that, her attention on the meeting room and the two who just talked in there. Slowly, her deadly shadow moving with her, the Lady of Pain moves off and down the very middle of the street, to who knows where and for what purpose. No conversation between angels and devils is insignificant. The Nine Hells are about law and evil. They are the religion of merciless bureaucracy. They are the former elite armies of the celestial realm of law and order that broke away from goodness. They represent an alternate view on how laws should be applied throughout the cosmos. Nisus is the home of the generals and royalty of the Nine Hells. It is the home dimension of Asmodeus and his incredibly huge fortress, Malshim. It was once, in earlier editions, a sphere of blasted rock with countless deep fissures and chasms, inside of which were millions of citadels and keeps, lairs and vaults. This is where the leaders of the armies of hell met to form strategies and plot over increasing power um, of the fiends. Previously, this was achieved solely through the acquisition of souls and packs and powerful artifacts, and the gaining of souls was achieved by an arrangement with the Celestial Court, whereby those who broke divine laws were sent for punishment to the Nine Hells. These souls are not just random bad people. 
or those who are lawful evil in life and pass on to the nine hells and death. These are those who either made a deal with the devil, broke divine laws, not necessarily the laws of mortal society, or something that is essentially punishable by the gods. Punishment is not something that is done in Celestia or other divine realms. It is something that is done in the infernal realms. The Nine Hells has all sorts of evil types here, but in the end, it may be, uh, uh, in and of itself, the plane is actually very structured, very methodical, very calculating, uh, very much about the enforcement of law. It may be of interest that the devils have no issues visiting the plane of Mechanus. Uh, the intrinsic lawful nature of the plane is actually fairly comfortable to them. Uh, but at their core, devils are not happy beings. They are profoundly broken beings that feel they have suffered the greatest injustice ever inflicted in the entire history of the universe. And in some ways, they're right. Back before such concerns as good and evil were so important, there was the ultimate and cataclysmic struggle between law and chaos. The universe of D&D was a place of creation and order. It was invaded by outsiders and everything was going terribly, terribly wrong at nearly every level. Celestials came into existence to fix things, to restore what order they could and salvage whatever they could from the universe to be used elsewhere. However, in fighting the chaos that threatened to render everything into pointless madness, Celestia itself divided into different lines of thought and different philosophies on how order should be restored and maintained. The devils obviously think the best way to do this is control, oppression, fear, pain and bureaucracy. For this, they were cast out of Celestia and made a new realm for themselves, harvesting the power of souls to give them the ability of belief to shape the universe as they willed it to be. Divine, morph divine morphisms, what they're called. This is the power that makes souls so very valuable and sought after, their ability to shape reality. In the dramatic and formative conflict of the Dawn War, there were primordials, there were gods in the astral sea, there were pantheons which were called in from other prime material worlds, such as the gods of Narath, the setting of 4th edition D&D, which would explain why so many people think that edition had no soul. Lol. Uh, there were the alien Oberynth. There were the newly formed demons of the, Ab uh, the Abyss. There were the Eugolos. There were many, many others. The giants, the dragons, the mortal races. It was very chaotic, and many times the universe was nearly unmade. But each time put back together, sometimes in a different order than it was before. So the nature of reality itself has been in flux in the DNA universe throughout the various editions of the game. This is occasionally quite hard to get your head around. Uh, smouldering at the heart of all this drama, though, finding advantage wherever they could from all of this disruption, hammering and pressuring things back together, snaring disrupted primordials and titans and webs of manipulation and eternal prisons, the devils have fought against chaos just as much as the celestials have from the very dawn of the realms before the world of Abiotoral even existed. At the apex of the hierarchy of the hells, Asmodeus is now a bona fide god. But things were not always like this. Things were not always like this. Way back in Dragon number 28, Asmodeus, we are told, is just the latest in a line of rulers of the nine hells. He was overthrown, uh, he overthrew uh, Beelzebul who in turn overthrew Satan. Elder Evils names the original ruler of hell as Zargon, the creature originally described in uh, Dungeon Module B4, The Lost City. The Book of Vile Darkness states that while Asmodeus is not the original ruler of the Nine Hells, he is the oldest of the devils. Fiendish Codex 2, Tyrants of the Nine Hells, says that Asmodeus began as a servant of the lawful gods, created the fight the demons of the abyss, so that the gods could concern themselves with creating worlds with sentient beings on them. Asmodeus was assigned to guard the entrance of the prison of the god Tharazdun, which was located in the abyss. The demon god uh, Lord Pazuzu appeared to Asmodeus, as detailed in Demononicon, and encouraged him to act on his thoughts of rebellion, obtaining a small piece of the shard of evil at the heart of the abyss that created the abyss, handing it over to Asmodeus, who used it to create his infamous ruby rod. However, Whatever worlds the gods created, the demons inevitably were unleashed into it by the actions of the very mortal creatures the gods had made. As Modius, who was the one who said, hey, the mortals are so out of control because you gave them curiosity, but there are no consequences for them if they go against your commands, so hand them over to me and I will sort them out. So the gods did, and they created the Pact Primeval. And as Modius created uh, Bath Bathion, with his new soul power, and gathered as many souls to him as he could, turning many of them into new enforcers. However, 
things went from bad to worse. The angels were transformed transformed into the first devils, and the beautiful astral dominion of Baathion was transformed into the prison realm known as the Nine Hells of Bator. Asmodeus became a god himself, albeit one trapped inside his own dominion. Uh, the Codex itself admits that this is part of the whole truth, part of the whole truth. Asmodeus did not depart from the upper planes under amicable circumstances. He was cast out and literally, literally fell to the lower planes, sustaining serious wounds which have never healed. Part of Asmodeus's long-term plans includes using the magical energy harvested from souls in order to heal his wounds and ultimately the complete destruction of the upper planes as well as one day achieving godhood, which he has since achieved. The many of the plans suggest Asmodeus' true form is that of a giant serpent, which he uh, he was cast out of the upper planes before the creation of the current gods, and his fall created the eighth and ninth planes of hell. He is currently still recovering from his wounds in the pits of the ninth hell, and his devil form is just an avatar of the, of the real Asmodeus. No one who tells the story of the true form of Asmodeus survives more than 24 hours of the telling. Whoops. I actually covered this version uh, in the Introduction to Nine Hells videos, but yes, it's just one of many conflicting myths. Um, these, I might add, are also conflicting faiths. Asmodeus is frequently the focus of cult activities by mortals. And to explain why there are so many cultists and such in D&D, before you ask, where people can see clerics heal folks and know that there are divine powers. Considering all the people... I mean, consider it, right? All the people who are basically selfish, evil, self-serving, lazy, mean, and greedy. Evil people, right? Divine power is denied to them. But they live in a world where they can see the power and protection it grants. If divine power is so denied to them, why would they not seek out other means of attaining the same power? So they turn to other sources. They turn to the fiends. They open themselves to an alternate force of law in the chaos, in the cosmos. Without the petty restrictions of goodness, without the confines of following divine restrictions on how they live their lives. This easy access to power is why cults are so popular and they spring up all the time all over the place. Because people are weak. They, they, they look for power without consequences. They don't realize what the trap is that they're putting themselves in. Asmodeus is devoted to oppression and might through, uh, th might through subversive action. He imposes strict rules and harsh punishments on his followers. The cult of Asmodeus urges its adherents to seek power over others, to repay evil and further evil, with further evil, so an eye for an eye, to exploit kindness for personal gain and to show no compassion for the weak and downtrodden. This is done subtly, subtly, usually legally and never overtly. Typical rhetoric from worshippers of Asmodeus will discuss promoting personal excellence and independence, taking care of one's own affairs, and ridding oneself of weakness. Uh, sometimes one will hear, hear of ascending to godhood, going up the ladder, of no gods, no masters. When harming innocence, these actions are discussed as providing motivation to succeed. Most often, ritual practices are deeply secretive and not publicly discussed. Most followers will not publicly admit their worship of Asmodeus, nor will they compromise their potential bargaining position of greater power over non-believers. Uh, and also, those cult headquarters are usually underground or in rich mansions, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, secretive covens, you could say. Anyway, through all five editions of Dungeons & Dragons, Asmodeus has is depicted as the strongest, most cunning, and most handsome of all devils. He is typically described as appearing as a giant human, over 13 feet tall, with dark skin and hair, uh, red eyes, handsome features, and small horns on his forehead. He dresses in regal finery of unimaginable expense. A single article of clothing worn by Asmodeus is worth more money than an average nation will spend on food in a year. Beneath his clothing, Asmodeus' body, though, is covered in bloody wounds, which he sustained when he fell from the upper planes. His wounds ooze blood daily, and any drop of blood which touches the ground grows into a powerful devil. He is described in the Book of Vile Darkness as a calm, chillingly reasonable being with a modest appearance that hides his true power. Nisus is populated with many vassals and underlings of Osmodius. They are numerous, and the roster has changed a lot over the many editions of the Nine Hells. So... Um, in the history of the Nine Hells. So I will not go into great detail on who these vessels are or where the unholy, uh, where the, um, or were. <laughs> I might actually, uh, yeah, I might actually go over a few of the names of them at the end of this video. 
Uh, so stay tuned. The unholy symbol of Asmodeus is three inverted triangles, here it is, uh, arranged in a long triangle. His domains are knowledge and trickery, and also he is known as, in many places, the god of indulgence, the lord of the ninth, the cloven, and the old hoof and horn. If you um, permit me, I'll read you a passage from the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, because this is the most up-to-date info on Asmodeus that I have. Uh, So here's the current state of affairs. Open worship of Asmodeus began roughly a century ago when small cults of charismatic leaders sprang up in the aftermath of the spell plague. That that disaster left many asking why the gods were angry or had abandoned them. To those questioners, the faithful of Asmodeus provided answers and a god who would forgive all their faults. Still, for the next few decades, the cult of Asmodeus struggled for acceptance. In the beliefs of the people of the north, which coincide with many tales told by dwarves, elves, and others, Asmodeus is the lord of the ninth, the leader of all devils of the nine hells. People know devils to be iron-minded and silver-tongued purveyors of temptation, whose price for their boons can be dear as one's soul. It's said that when a soul waits on the fugue plane for a deity to take it to an appropriate afterlife, devils approach the soul and offer it a chance at power and immortal pleasures. All the soul needs to do is make one step out of the dust and the milling crowd and put a foot on the first rung of the infernal ladder that represents the hierarchy of the nine hells, and they got him. The faithful of Asmodeus acknowledge that devils offer their worship a, worship as a path that is not for everyone, uh, just as eternally basking in the light of Lathander or endlessly swinging a hammer in the mines of Moradin may not be for everyone else. Those who serve Asmodeus in life hope to be summoned out of the moaning masses of the few plane after death. They yearn for the chance to master their own fates with all of eternity to achieve their goals. To those not so dedicated, priests of Asmodeus offer the pro- uh, prospect of reprie- reprieve in the afterlife. All souls wait on the few plane for a deity's pleasure, which determines where a soul will spend the rest of eternity. Those who live their lives most in keeping with the deity's outlook are taken first. Others who have transgressed in the eyes of their favoured god who have not followed any particular ethos, might wait for centuries before Kalimvor judges where they go. People who fear such a fate can pray to Asmodeus, as priests say, and in return a devil will grant them a waiting soul some comfort. Today, shrines of Asmodeus are still rare, and temples are almost unheard of, but many folk have adopted the habit of asking Asmodeus for reprieve from their sins, after transgressing against a god in some way. A person prays to Asmodeus for something to provide respite, during the long wait. Asmodeus is known to grant people what they wish, and thus people pray for all the delights and distractions they desire most in life. Those who transgress in ways often ask Asmodeus to hide their sins from the gods, and priests say that he will do so, but with a price after you die. Nisus these days <clears throat> is a hollow core of, a, of the world of Bartol. Well, there's a molten inferno at its heart, but surrounding that there's a spherical cavern of mind-boggling proportions, which is the layer of Nisus, a spherical cavern surrounding the core of battle. The devils of the ninth dwell in iron citadels that protrude from the crevasses and stalactites which formed by Nisus's floor. Malshim itself protrudes directly from a massive volcanic crater, and Nisus is inhabited by the brazen devils, the guards of Malshim, the firebrand, firebred hellhounds, as Modis's pets, Storm Devils, Le- uh, Legion Devils, Pit Fiends, the aristocracy, aristocracy of the Hells, and War Devils. These Iron Citadels house every manner and kind of freaky stuff, some of which is just world or probably game-breaking, such as a half-fiendish Tarrasque, uh, the counterpart of the Shard of Evil and the Rod of Seven Parts, the Orb of Total Neutrality, a spell which details how to create a world-sized demiplane permanently, other parts of Vecna, a fusion warheads, a wand of annihilation spheres, a codex of the doors of sigil, the list of names of all the Yugoloths, and so on. Scattered around, hidden deep. Uh, There are trapped and imprisoned primordials here, along with galleries of collected samples of mortal races from every prime material world that Asmodeus has dealt with, including many of which that are the last of their kind, from worlds that are now layers of the abyss. People trapped like bugs in amber, preserved in terrible solitude, all time. As for Malshim, it is described as being very, very, very big, like New York big, a fortress palace, full of exotic wonders and terrible horrors. 
As Modis is said to have a dark fey aesthetic to his residence with a corrupted nature theme, both beautiful and also quite disturbing the more you look at it. Information is the currency of Nisus and influence is the currency of Malsheen. Those who play the cards right, who show sufficient promise, may find themselves as servants directly under trans, uh, Asmodeus himself, which means they in turn have an influence over whole worlds, entire infernal armies, treasures and indulgences beyond mortal reckoning. Influence in Malshim is worth any price to the many devils that operate in and from Nessus. More common in this plane are, as I said, the Brazen Devils and Firebrand Hellhounds, Storm Devils, Legion Devils, War Devils, Assassin Devils, and of course the Pit Fiends. The air of Nessus is frequented by many Pit Fiends, flying from one uh, place to another, busy with the complex administration of the forces of the Nine Hells. Aside from the Chasms and Citadels, Malshim itself, oh, fun fact, uh, when a non-lawful evil creature walks on the stones of Malshim, uh, smoke rises from the places where their feet touch. Just a little tip of information. There is a lake called uh, Cossetus, which lies far from Malsheim, high up on a bowl of rocks surrounded by crags. Uh, It's known as the Lake of Fear. The surface is a smooth, frozen sheet, and the ice is tens of feet thick and full of the frozen bodies of those who would have crossed the lake, um, as it always rises up like jaws and snaps shut around travellers. So quick thinking and swift action can avoid entrapment. However, once locked in the ice, it takes a strength equal to a storm giant to break free. That's a strength of 29, folks. Winding around the crags and seemingly randomly appearing here and there is the River Leith, a river of forgetfulness. I don't know where it comes from or where it ends up. Or do I? Do I? What I do remember is that all creatures who touch the green water forget. If they save versus poison the effect wears off. Otherwise, they suffer the effects of a feeble mind spell, that's page 239 of the Player's Handbook, permanently, unless cured by a wish, alter reality, or limited wish. Or they are taken to the higher realms of Mount Celestia. Even so, the victim will lose memory of the events that occurred before they touched the river leaf. So best avoid those waters unless forgetting the past is exactly what the character needs. Some say that the river is an alternate route, a back door into the prime material plane, and that from there to the deepest layer of hell. But no, no living testimony from anyone is around, so it's not confirmed whether that's true or not. Further out, surrounding the crags and the river, is a huge forest where the leaves of all the trees are on fire permanently. A branch can be removed from the flame, uh, from the trees, and the flame will continue to burn. Nothing short of a wish spell will put them out while in hell. On an outside plane, they can be doused with the spell magic or protection from evil, but are not normal fire and can't be influenced by spells that affect flames. Uh, The trees bleed a blue-green ichor. This stuff is crazy valuable for use in magic potion spells and scrolls. I mean, it's, oh boy, it's just like the magic magic, um, fluid that you can use for all sorts of different stuff. There's also a region... um, of uh called the fire winds where sweeping roaming walls of fire rip around the place scorching whatever way it gets in the way uh, much like getting hit by a fireball i like to think that these are like convergences of flammable gas and heat waves from the massive spherical inferno that blazes above uh, from the perspective of those walking around inside the great cavern of Nisus, it would be like solar flares that tear across the landscape swirling around crags rocks and funneling through ravines like flash floods of fire some sages say that at the heart of the super fortress of Malshim is a cosmic gate that will lead anywhere, and is not only uh, it was it wasn't actually built by the devils, but um, yeah, and they can't destroy it or interfere with its operation or use it themselves. Uh, any creature of lawful evil alignment is vaporized if they try. There are many legends and folktales to support this, and many say that to escape the nine hells, one must reach the very heart of it to attain freedom. Although, honestly, what a daunting prospect. One theory is that the gate was created by a greater god as a kind of a clause in the Pact Primeval. The many armies of the Nine Hells tend to move around a lot, but the fortress and thousands of towers of Malshim are surrounded by the armies of hell, both on the ground and in the air at all times. Um, There's also a theory that the fortress of Malshim was built around the gate to conceal it and basically block it off to protect it um, so that people can't escape. As for the creatures that call this plane home, 
um, that are not devils, well, they're, they are nightmares. Literally nightmares. There's nightmares there. As well as a few evil flame and earth elementals fussing around and trying to figure out ways to get the, some of the primordials free. There are honored servants of the Nine Hells who are camped out, waiting for an, an audience with Asmodeus. All manner of beings from all sorts of places, different species, different philosophies and motives. And all of them are lawful evil and find themselves in nieces, soaking up the heat rays and the frequent invigorating blast of uh, winds of flame or getting into a furious debate with another petitioner arguing the finer points of something or other as lawful evil people tend to do they are uh, there are tyrants overlords blackguards evil wizards dragons lots of dragons oh so many dragons and some of them are titanic like you're not aware that why the ground was leathery until you realize the bridge with the, with the spines was the back of the dragon that you're walking across big very powerful monsters who don't mind fire don't need to eat or drink and are lawful evil find Nisa's to be a lovely place to call home and they usually find some place in the totalitarian hierarchy of the hells oh and infernal war machines there are lots of lots of infernal war machines so right okay so we reached the, the end of the video so i'll just go over um some of the frequent or former um members of the uh the royalty of uh Nisus. so we've got ben sozia the queen of hell um, consort of asmodeus uh, Adramalek, Count, Chancellor of Hell, a cruel and malicious Chancellor of Hell, aids Asmodeus greatly from his tower in the Overlord's Palace. Keeper of Records, answers only to Asmodeus himself. Um, there's there's lots. There's, let's see, Fongor, Inquisitor of Hell, dreaded Inquisitor, responsible directly for uh, the provision of complete and accurate news on the other Hells and other planes. And to do this, he's subverted lots of spies and also um, enlist spies of his own and has perfected the art of torture on devils um, so you imagine he's got a lot to do with chain devils Bure, duke of hell uh, he's in company uh, in command of 15 companies of pit fiends inclined to be a rather melancholy person although always polite in speech appears to delight in practical jokes should be remembered though that he's evil as anything Bune duke of hell as uh, he's kind of greedy f um, very fond of material wealth enjoys manipulating lesser beings of all sorts including his own warriors and although he's loyal to his motives he's actually quite cheeky to those who he considers to be superiors to himself but as many as tolerates his presence because he's the quickest and most careful in the execution of orders so he's very reliable morax is a duke of hell um in service of Asmodeus leading nine companies of pit fiends um he's a being of few words exalts in a good fight consummate wrestler likes wrestling uh pit fiends and hurling about and roaring um he's quite respected in the pit for his fairness and his loyalty and despises weakness and is angered by creatures who bluff or presume to have strength or stationed that they, that they don't possess or preserve or deserve rimon is another duke of hell uh He's uh, appears as an ice devil with a handsome human-like diabolically horned head, um, nasty and sadistic, little liked, uh, but quite loyal to Asmodeus. Um, yeah, he fights with the trident. He, yeah, he's it's kind of weird. He's an ice devil with a human head. Zagum is a ambitious, cold-blooded, um, considers cruelty be cruelty to be a self-indulgent waste of time whereas humor laughing with a fellow devil uh, pays dividends in terms of comradeship mutual aid respect and companionship therefore he's got a sense of humor and is constantly inventing new jokes and stunts to amuse others so zagum is quite an interesting character uh, his appears as a gigantic barbed devil with a long 15 foot tail and a jagged row of barbed spines running up his back culminating in a bony pair of edge spines in the back of the sides of his head and his scaled skin is crimson as hue uh, his eyes were yellow with black pupils so yeah also of note um just as we come, kind of come to uh the culmination of the nine hells series i may visit various bits and pieces of it um spells don't operate entirely reliably in the nine hells on the various layers and things um particularly in the older edition of the game not so much in the new edition of the game um but uh so things like clerical spells of command would be ineffective against greater devils detect evil is so overwhelmed in this place that um it just basically reacts negatively 
Uh, light and continual light are half as effective. Um, protection from evil just doesn't work. Protection from good effects are, have double normal strength. Um, yeah, holy symbols are ineffective. Uh, messenger doesn't work. Dust devil doesn't work. Um, prayers don't work, really. And uh, divinations rarely work as well. Um, the entire plane is pretty much protected against divination spells. It's just, you know, you can't look into the nine hells. So, yeah, a, a nice long video to end uh, the Explorers, uh, the, the series on the Nine Hells. Um, there'll be, if you're looking for more information there, we've just been following the Explorers series. I mostly cover these in the other uh, Monster Ecology series where I'm talking about the various types of devil. Um, and, I'll be vis and I visit the various planes of existence that the devils uh, live on in the Nine Hells. So go and check those videos out if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll be back again shortly with a monster, monster ecology video. Hopefully I'll get it out this weekend. Uh, and thank you once again, everybody who missed my um, thanks for the 5,000 subscribers. Uh, it's great. And uh, yeah, the channel just continues to grow and power forward. And I thank you all for that very much. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll catch you again soon.